it is a pleasure to be here because uh, it was the Center for Fiction that did uh, administer the Fatiman Award, which was given to uh, the book that Noreen just mentioned. Uh, that award, incidentally, is given to novels 15 years or more uh, in print uh, that, well, self-evidently deserve it. <laughs> it uh, the book I'm going to read from this evening, All That Is, is uh, very simply the story of uh, a man who became a book editor and was a editor, completely satisfied <coughs> to be one all his professional life. It covers uh, a long period in his life, perhaps uh, 30 or uh, more than 30, almost 40 years. Uh, his name is Philip Goldman. He he, um, well, I, <clears throat> I remember when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president. I was seven years old at the time. These were tremendous years, and uh, they were soon followed by World War II. And those years and the years that follow are essentially Bowman's years. That's when the book, in essence, begins. He's a young naval officer. He's experiencing the war in uh, naval battles off Okinawa in the last year of the war. He comes back, returns to college. He's a naive young man. His, almost his entire experience has been school, being in the Navy, briefly for two or three years, and then returning to school. He's unsuccessful in finding a job in journalism, which is what his first choice was. And he falls into the publishing world, oh, not by accident, but come sa. So somebody told him they were looking for uh, someone to read manuscripts at a publishing house. He applied, he was hired, Salary was minimal, and eventually he became an editor and went on from there. As I said, he was a bit naive and in uh, romantic matters, sexual matters, completely naive and, and uh, very dissatisfied with that. <clears throat> St. Patrick's Day was sunny and unusually mild. Men were in shirt sleeves, and from the appearance of things, work was ending at noon. The bars were full. Coming into one of them from out of the sunlight, Bowman, his eyes blinded, could barely make out the faces along the bar, but found a place to stand near the back, <coughs> where they were all shouting and calling to one another. The bartender brought him, brought him his drink, and he took it and looked around. There were men and women drinking, young women mostly, two of them, he never forgot this moment, standing near him to his right, one dark hair with dark brows, and when he could see her better, a faint down along her jawbone. The other, <coughs> <coughs> The other was blonde, with a bare, shining forehead and wide-set eyes, instantly compelling, even in some way coarse. He was so struck by her face that it was difficult to look at her. She stood out so. On the other hand, he couldn't keep himself from doing it. He was almost fearful of looking. He raised his glass toward them. Happy St. Patrick's, he managed to say. Can't hear you, one of them cried. He tried to introduce himself. The place was too noisy. It was like a raging party they were in the middle of. What's your name, he called. 
Vivian, the blonde girl said. He stepped closer. Louise was the dark-haired one. She already had a secondary role, but Bowman, <laughs> trying not to be too direct, included her. <laughs> Do you live around here, he said. Louise answered. She lived on 53rd Street. Vivian lived in Virginia. Virginia, Bowman said. Stupidly, he felt as if it were China. <laughs> I live in Washington, Vivian said. He could not keep his eyes from her. Her face was as if somehow it was not completely finished, with smoldering features, a mouth not eager to smile, a riveting face that God had stamped with a simple answer to life. When they asked what he did, the noise had quieted a little. He replied he was an editor. An editor? Yes. Of what? Magazines? Books, he said. I work at Braden and Baum. They had never heard of it. I was thinking of going to Clark's, he said, but there was all this noise in here, and I just came in to see what was going on. I have to go back to work. What are you um, doing later? They were going to a movie. Want to come, Louise said. He suddenly liked, even loved her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. Can I meet you later? I'll meet you back here. What time? After work, any time. They agreed to meet at six. All afternoon, he was almost giddy and found it hard to keep his mind on things. Time moved with a terrible slowness. But at a quarter to six, walking quickly, almost running, he went back. He was a few minutes early. They were not there. He waited impatiently until 6.15 and 6.30. They never appeared. With a sickening feeling, he realized what he had done. He let them go without asking for a telephone number or address. 53rd Street was all he knew, and he would never see them, her, again. Hating his ineptness, he stayed for nearly an hour. Towards the end, striking up a conversation with the man next to him, so that if by chance they did finally come, he would not seem foolish and dog-like standing there. What was it, he wondered, that had betrayed him and made them decide not to come back? Had they been approached by someone else after he left? He was miserable. He felt the terrible emptiness of men who were ruined. Yes. You see everything collapse in a single day. <clears throat> he went to work in the morning, still feeling anguish. He could not talk about it to Edmonds, another editor. It was in him like a deep splitter, splinter, together with a sense of failure. He sat silently reading when Gretchen came over. There's someone on the phone for you. Bowman picked up his phone and said somewhat curtly, well, it was her. He felt a moment of insane happiness. <laughs> she was apologizing. They had come back at six the night before, but hadn't been able to find the bar. They couldn't remember the street. <laughs> yes, of course, Bowman said. I'm so sorry, but that's all right. We even went to Clark, she said. I remember you said that. I'm so glad you called. Well, I just wanted you to know that uh, we tried to come back and meet you. No, no, that's all right. That's fine. Look, give me your address, will you? In Washington? Yes, anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> she gave it, and Louise's as well. She's going back to Washington that afternoon, she said. Do you, what time is the train? Do you, do you have time for lunch? Not really. The train was at one. 
oh, that's too bad. Uh, maybe another time, he said foolishly. Well, bye, she said after a pause. Goodbye, he somehow agreed. But he had her address. He looked at it after hanging up. It was precious beyond words. He didn't know her last name. In the great vault of Penn Station, with the light and wide blocks coming down through the glass onto the crowd, who was always waiting, Bowman made his way. He was nervous, but then caught sight of her, standing unaware. Vivian! She looked around and then saw him. Wow, it's you. What are you doing here? I wanted to say goodbye, he said, and added, I brought you a book I thought you might like. Vivian had had books as a child. <laughs> she and her sister, children's books. They had even fought over them. She had read Nancy Drew and some others. To be honest, she said, she didn't read that much. Forever Amber. Her skin was luminous. Well, thank you. It's one of ours, he said. She read the title. It was very sweet of him. It was not something she would ever expect that a boy she knew would do, or even grown-ups. She was 20 years old, but not yet ready to think of herself as a woman, probably because she was still largely supported by her father and because of her devotion to him. She had gone to junior college and gotten a job. The women she knew were known for their style, their writing ability, and their husbands. Also their nerve. She had an aunt who had been robbed in her home at gunpoint by two black men and had said to them coolly, we've been too good to you people. <laughs> Omen wrote to her. And almost to his disbelief, she wrote back. Her letters were friendly and open. She came to New York several times that spring and early summer, <coughs> staying with Louise, even sharing the bed with her, laughing in pajamas. She had not yet told her father about her boyfriend. The one she had in Washington worked at State or in the trust department at Riggs and were in many ways replicas of their parents. She did not think of herself as a replica. She was daring, in fact, taking the train up to see a man she had met in a bar, whose background she did not know, but who seemed to have depth and originality. They went to Luchow's, where the waiter said, Guten Abend, and Bowman talked to him for a moment, for a moment in German. I didn't know you spoke German. Well, until recently, it wasn't a great thing to do, Bowman said. <laughs> He'd taken German at Harvard, he explained, because it's the language of science. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a scientist. I went back and forth between a number of things. I thought for a while I might teach. I still have a certain yearning for teaching. Then I decided to be a journalist, but I wasn't able to get a job as one. I heard about a job as a reader then. It was pure luck, or maybe destiny. What do you think of the idea of destiny? <laughs> Hadn't thought about it, she said casually. <laughs> he liked talking to her, and the occasional smile that made her forehead shine. She was wearing a sleeveless dress, and the roundness of her small shoulders gleamed. Her little finger was curled, and held apart as she ate a bite of bread. Gestures, facial expressions, way of dressing, <coughs> these were the revealing things. He was imagining places where they might go together, where no one knew them, and he would have her to himself for days on end, though he was uncertain of how it might happen. New York's a wonderful place, isn't it, he said? Yeah, I like coming here. How do you know Louise? We were in boarding school in the same class. 
the first thing she ever told me was a dirty joke. Well, not exactly dirty, but you know. He told her about the time that the first letters, the E and S, on the big sign above the Essex house had gone out. And there it was, 40 stories up, shining in the night. <laughs> it went no further. It went on the same course. At the end of the evening, at the front door, he was prepared to say good night. But she acted as if he were not there unlocking the door, saying nothing. Louise was gone for the weekend to visit her parents. Vivian was nervous, though she did not want to show it. He went upstairs with her. Would you like a cup of coffee, she asked. Yes, that would be no, he said. Not really. They sat for a few moments in silence, and then she simply leaned forward and kissed him. The kiss was light, but ardent. Do you want to? She asked. She did not take everything off. Shoes, stockings, and skirt. That was all. She was not prepared for more. They kissed and whispered. As she slid from her white panties, a white that seemed sacred, he barely breathed the fineness of her, the blondish fleece. He could not believe they were doing this. I don't have anything, he whispered. There was no answer. He was inexperienced, but it was natural and overwhelming. Also too quick, he couldn't help it. He felt embarrassed. Her face was close to his. I'm sorry, he said. I couldn't stop it. She said nothing. She had almost no way to judge. She went into the bathroom, and Bowman lay back in awe at what had happened and feeling intoxicated by a world that had suddenly opened wide to the greatest pleasure, pleasure beyond knowing. He knew of the joy that might lie ahead. Vivian was thinking all along less heady lines. <laughs> <laughs> there was the chance of her becoming PG, or, though she had, in truth, only an inexact idea of how likely that was. At school, there had been a lot of talk, but it was only talk and vague. Still, there were stories of girls who got away the first time. <coughs> It'd be just her luck, she thought. Of course, hadn't been entirely the first time. You make me think of a pony, he said lovingly. A pony? Why? Well, you're just beautiful and free. I don't see how that's like a pony. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, ponies bite, mine did. She nestled against him, and he tried to think along her lines. Whatever might happen, they had done it. He felt only exultation. <clears throat> Bowman comes from New Jersey. <clears throat> In Summit, where he wanted his mother to meet Vivian, to see and approve of her, he took her first to a diner across from City Hall that had been there for years. It had actually been a railroad car with windows along the side facing the avenue. Inside, the floor was tile and the ceiling pale wood that curved down into the wall. A counter where customers sat ran the length of the place. It was always more crowded in the morning. The railroad station, the Mars and Essex line that went to the city, was just down the street. The tracks were low and out of sight. At night, the lights of the diner were the only lights along the street. You entered by a door opposite the counter, and there was another door at the end. It was here that Hemingway placed his story, The Killers, 
Goldman said. Right here in this diner, the counter, everything. Do you know the story? It's marvelous, fabulously written. If you've never read another word of his, you'll know right away what a great writer he is. It's in the evening. Nobody's in the place. There are no customers. It's empty. And two men in tight black overcoats come in and sit down at the counter. They look at the menu and order. And one of them says to the counterman, this is some town. What's the name of this place? And the counterman, who's frightened, of course, says, Summit. It's right there in the story, Summit. And when the food comes, they eat with their gloves on. They're there to kill a Swede, they tell the counterman. They know the Swede always comes there. He's an ex-fighter named Old Anderson, who double-crossed the mob somehow. One of them takes a sawed-off shotgun from beneath his coat and goes into the kitchen to hide and wait. Did this actually happen? No, 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 he wrote it in Spain. It's just made up. Well, you don't believe it's made up reading it. That's what's so incredible. You absolutely believe it. And they kill him. It's better than that. They don't kill him because he doesn't show up. But he knows they're after him. They'll come again. He's big. He was a boxer. But whatever he did, they're going to kill him. He just lies in bed in the rooming house, looking at the wall. I'd like to meet Hemingway, he said. Go down to Cuba and meet him. Maybe we could go together. Well, I don't know, she said. Maybe. You have to read him, she said. <laughs> Beatrice, his mother, had been eager to meet her and was also struck by her looks, though in a different way. <laughs> the freshness and naked animal statement, how much one knows from the start. She had brought, she had brought flowers and set the table in the dining room where they seldom ate, usually using the table in the kitchen which was the real heart of the house, together with the sitting room where they often sat in front, in, pardon me, often sat in front of the fireplace talking and having a drink. Now there was this girl with somewhat stiff manners. She was from Virginia, and Beatrice asked, what part, Middleburg? We really live near to Upperville, Vivian replied. Upperville. It sounded rural and small. It was, in fact, small. There was one place to eat, but no town water or sewage. Nothing had changed there for a hundred years. And people there liked it that way, whether they lived in an old house without heat or on a thousand acres. Upperville, in the country and beyond, was an exalted name the emblem of a proud parochial class of which Vivian was a member. There was no place to stay. You had to live there. It's beautiful country, Bowman said. Beatrice said, I'd love to see it. What does your family do there? Farm, Vivian said. Well, my father farms some, but he also puts his fields up for grazing. I said, it must be big. Well, it's not terribly big. It's about 400 acres. <laughs> That's so interesting. Apart from farming, what is there to do? Daddy always says there's lots to do. He means looking after the horses. Horses? Yes. It was not that she was difficult to talk to, but you immediately felt the limits. <laughs> Vivian had gone to junior college, probably at the suggestion of her father to keep her out of mischief. She had a certain confidence based on things she absolutely knew and which had proved to be enough. Like all mothers, though, 
Beatrice hoped for a girl like herself, with whom she could speak easily, and his view of, whose view of life could almost perfectly be combined with her own. Among her pupils over the years, she could think of girls who were like that, good students with natural charm that you, admi you admired and were drawn to. But there were also others, not so easily understood, and whose fate you were not meant to know. Um, didn't Liz Bohannon come from Middleburg? Beatrice asked, bringing up a name, a horse and society figure of the 30s, always photographed with her husband aboard some ship sailing to Europe or in their box at Saratoga. Yes, she has a big place. She's a friend of my father's. She's still around. Oh, very much around. There are a lot of stories about her, Vivian said. When they first bought their place, Longtree, that was the name then, she used to ride in from the hunt and let the dogs come right into the house. They'd jump up on the table and eat everything. After she got divorced, she calmed down a bit. Oh, you must know her then. Oh, yes. Vivian was eating somewhat carefully, not like a girl with a genuine appetite. The flowers, which Beatrice had moved to the side, were a lush backdrop for her. Some young pagan goddess who had cast a spell over her son, mm -hmm. though it wasn't entirely a spell. Beatrice had no way to measure how much in need of love he was and what forms that took. Meanwhile, he was absolutely sure of one thing, that he would never meet someone like <coughs> Vivian again. He saw himself tumbled with her among the bedclothes and fragrance of married life, the meals and holidays of it, the shared rooms, the glimpses of her half-dress, her blondness, the pale hair where her legs met, the sexual riches that would be there forever. When he told his mother he hoped to marry her, Beatrice, though afraid it would prove nothing, protested how unalike the two of them were, how little they had in common. They had a great <coughs> deal in common, Bowman defiant, defiantly said. What they had in common was more vital than similar interests. It was wordless understanding and accord. What Beatrice did not say, what she deeply felt, was that Vivian had no soul. <laughs> but to say it would be unforgivable. She merely sat silent. After a moment, she said, I hope you won't rush into anything. In her heart, she feared. She knew the thing. In her heart, she feared. She knew the things you cannot see when you are too young. She hoped that with a little time, the infatuation would pass. She can only press his head against her in love and understanding. I only want you to be happy, truly happy. I would be truly happy. I mean, in your deepest heart. Yes, in my deepest. It was love the furnace into which everything is dropped. Mm -hmm. <laughs>